Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We are gathered together. We are going to celebrate communion today. And so we have our prepackaged stuff. If you are at home celebrating communion, uh, if you want to participate in that, please get some bread and some juice ready and we'll join together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we could gather together in your name to praise you and to worship you. I pray, Lord, your blessing upon this time that we're gathered together. May we experience your presence. May we be filled with your spirit as we worship you this day. We pray this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, sit, worship in however you feel. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to pray. heavens joining with the angels praise you forever and a day praise you on the earth now joining with creation calling all the nations to your praise if they could see how much your worth your power your might your endless love then surely we would never cease
May the peace of Christ be with you. Turn in virtual high fives and virtual hugs and say hi. Folks at home, leave a like. Let us know that you're here. All right, let's see what ping we get. Hey there, Pastor Mark. Hi, kids. Hi, Ping. What's going on, Ping? Pastor Mark, do you do funerals? Yes, I do, Ping. I'm sorry for your loss. Who, who passed away? I did. You did? Let me guess. Get this straight. You died? Well, I'm just faking my own death, and I'm trying to make it as authentic as I can. So I'm having a funeral. Well, nothing fancy. I'm hoping just a few nice words from you, maybe some world leaders in attendance, big procession and parade, you know, something simple and humble. Why are you trying to fake your own death, King? So I could be dead to sin. If sin thinks I'm dead, then I don't have to worry about sin anymore. The Apostle Paul tells us to consider ourselves dead to sin. You're forgetting the second part of that. It says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but in order to be alive in Christ, we have to be dead first. Ping, do you remember what we celebrated a few weeks ago? Um, Easter. We, we celebrated Easter. And what is Easter? The resurrection of Jesus. Don't you know that, Pastor Mark? Jesus rose again from the grave. He was put in the tomb because he died on the cross for, um, for our sins. So do we need to fake our, our death to fake out sin? Well, now that you put it that way, I guess we don't have to fake our death. Jesus did the dying part for us so we can be dead to sin. And then what is the second part of that thing? Oh yeah, he rose again on Easter so that we could be alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now you're getting it. But can you still do the funeral? Why, Ping? Well, I already bought this nice casket and I might as well put it to good use. King, I'm just happy that you're alive in Christ. So let's focus on how we can live our lives in Christ the best way we can. Uh, all right. I just wanted to hear all the nice things you have to say about me. I guess I got to go and see what Amazon's casket return policy is. Next, See you next week, kids. Bye! See ya, Ping. Ping's always getting into crazy things, crazier and crazier. Maybe his uh, writer is getting a little <laughs> desperate for ideas. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for life. We thank you that you died on the cross for us. And that you rose again to give us new life. Help us to live that life to its fullest and to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. All the kids can follow. Uh, teacher Nikki to the back for child care and child children's church. That's the word I'm looking for. Well, good morning, everyone. There are just a couple things. Again, we're celebrating communion uh, this today, and we'll be um, doing that after the, the sermon. So people at home, uh, again, if you want to celebrate with us, uh, please have some bread and 
uh, some juice ready. And um, tomorrow we'll be meeting as the session. The session will be meeting at 7 p.m. and we'll be meeting in person at the coffee hour room. Um, if any elders need to uh, meet via Zoom, please let me know so we could set that up. Uh, the only other thing that I have is the VBS is coming um, for on June 21st through the 25th. There are a, a list of things that we are looking for, the pop-up tents and the sheets especially. Um, if you can offer those, uh, please let me know. The other thing is that um, one of the things that we'll be doing is handing out these Bibles to the kids who participate. There's a bunch of Bibles on the tables in the coffee hour room. So if you would like to write a message to one of the kids, um, actually, when you open it up, they're really small print. It's just the New Testament, but it's still really small print. But anyways, if you would like to leave or write a message to the kids uh, during the coffee hour time, since we don't have coffee, might as well write a note for one of the kids and we'll give, hand them out during the VBS and that'd be great. We're also looking for um, volunteers who would be uh, available to help as group leaders, group helpers, craft leaders. And um, we are in charge of um, snacks. And so if you are uh, wanting to help with snacks, please uh, let me know. With that, are there any joys or concerns from the congregation? Prayers for Jim Now. He had pretty extensive back surgery on Friday. Jim Now, back surgery. Any other joys or concerns? Well, then let us pray. Lord, we, we come to you as the church family and as um, your people. We thank you, Lord, that you are gracious to us. And you are faithful and steadfast in your love. We praise you for the new life we have in Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would help us to live into that new life with energy and imagination and love, Lord. We lift up the people that we care about, the people that uh, need your healing, your peace, your comfort. We ask, Lord, that you be with Jim now as he's uh, recovering from extensive back surgery. I pray that you would place your healing hands upon him and that you'd be um, mending him and healing him in the places that need to be healed, Lord, and that you would give him uh, strength and encouragement as he uh, recovers, Lord. So bless him and bless those around him that he may uh, recover. We pray, Lord, for our congregation, and we pray for those who, um, who might be alone, and those who might be uh, discouraged, and those who need your peace. We pray for those who need healing. Help us, Lord, to be hands and, and feet of Christ, and reaching out to those around us, sharing your love and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for listening to our hearts and searching us and knowing us. And we pray, Lord, all these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a quick reminder, we have the offering box in the back, or you could give online or mail your check-in. Thank you. I once was dead in sin, alone and helpless. Continue to worship. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works the hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. 
think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in on a cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart, I shall bow in humble adoration. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame i love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so i cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged crown And exchange it someday for a crown In the old rugged cross Stained with blood so divine A wondrous beauty I see for it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross i will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever i'll share so I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Please be seated, everyone. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Romans 6, 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? 
Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 1 through 14. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word that continues to speak to us even to this day. And so we ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that we may discern your message to us, help us to understand, help us to comprehend your will for us, and show us what it means that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. So over the years, I have found that there is a lot of spiritual formation that can happen simply by doing chores around the house. Whether it's vacuuming, cooking dinner, mowing the lawn, doing home repair, or whatever you need to do to keep the household working, there is something you can learn spiritually by doing some of these mundane things around the house. Today in particular, I'm thinking about washing the dishes. It seems like I am always doing the dishes, and so perhaps God is trying to teach me something, and I'm just too slow to learn what he's saying. Anyway, when you wash the dishes, I think about God taking us and cleaning us from all the grime and dirt of sin. He washes each and every one of us, rinses us off, dries us, and then puts us with the rest of the dishes in the cupboard ready to be used. Sometimes dishes are harder to get clean, and there's a little bit more scrubbing to do. With some pots and pans, you need to turn up the heat to get the stubborn burnt-on crud to come off. But eventually, we get the dishes clean. But isn't it frustrating? Isn't it frustrating when you're done with the dishes, the kitchen is all nice and clean, and then you find that fork or the dish that was left hidden somewhere. Or worse yet, I can do all the dishes and make everything nice and clean in the kitchen and leave it for a moment. And then when I get back, there's a dirty dish in the sink waiting to be cleaned. I just cleaned the dish, the kitchen. Can't the kitchen stay clean for longer than five minutes? And haven't people learned to put their dishes into the dishwasher? 
obviously that person thinks that I love doing the dishes, so they leave these presents for me to wash. Why don't we dirty more dishes so that dad can have the joy of doing more dishes? That's the thought I had in mind when approaching today's passage in Romans. Paul just made the comparison between sin entering into the world through Adam and thus bringing condemnation and death and the grace that came through Jesus Christ which brings justification and new life. In comparing Adam and Jesus, Paul makes the argument that the grace through Jesus Christ is much greater than the sin and death that came by Adam. So much so that even though sin increased with the giving of the law, grace abounded even more. And so Paul begins this chapter with the rhetorical question, what are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? Grace is good. And since grace abounds with increased sin, shouldn't we just keep on sinning so that there will be more grace in the world? Mark likes doing dishes. It's good to have clean dishes. Shouldn't we make more dirty dishes so that we can have clean dishes once again? See how backwards and counterintuitive that thought is? The deed is done. Dishes are clean. Why would you go and intentionally dirty the dishes again just so that they can be washed? We are cleansed by sin. Does it make sense to go on and keep on sinning so that there can be more grace? Grace is good, but it's better if we don't have to increase it. Increasing grace means that we are intentionally messing up and we are not living the way that God intends for us to live, glorifying him. We hope to have grace on the occasion that we slip up and make mistakes. We don't want to take that grace for granted. And that is what we're doing if we go out and intentionally sin just for the sake of increasing grace. Again, we have been made clean from sin. Why would we want to go out and dirty ourselves once again? Paul makes the argument that in Christ we have died to sin. He writes in, verses, uh, in verse 2, he says, By no means... How can we who died to sin go on living in it? By no means is a very, very strong negation of that rhetorical question. May it never be. God forbid it that this would happen. And then Paul responds to that rhetorical question with another rhetorical question. He says, we have died to sin. How can we go on living in it? Now, Paul goes on to talk about the importance of baptism to illustrate how we are dead to sin. Now, in a few weeks here on May 23rd, we'll be celebrating the baptism of several members of our church family. Then we could see firsthand the powerful imagery of baptism in the Christian life. From the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to... Um, being washed and cleansed from sin, to the dying with Christ and being raised to new life. It is that dying with Christ and being raised to new life imagery that Paul is using here. Presbyterians are geared more towards sprinkling and pouring. And that's why we have the baptismal font here. Um, I think we're more geared towards infant baptism and not so much towards adult believer baptism. As such, you don't find the big bathtub-like baptistry in front of the sanctuary as you might find in other churches. Immersion baptism is when the person being baptized is fully immersed in water. They're usually laid back into the water 
and then they're brought back up. The laying down representing dying and being buried into the ground and being raised up, brought back to new life. So what Paul is saying is that when we are baptized in Christ, we are united with Christ in his death. And because Christ rose again three days later, we can be certain that we too will rise again. Paul says in verses 4 and 5, Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk and new, newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we are baptized as adults, or if we are confirmed in the faith, if you are baptized as an infant, we are declaring that we are trusting in the work that Christ has done to free us from sin by dying on the cross. And that we place our hope in the certainty of the resurrection to come. In the meantime, we commit to walking in that new life that comes with Christ's resurrection. That new life means that we are freed from the bondage to sin and death and alive to live for God in Christ Jesus. Paul says you must also, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Put in another way by Paul in Galatians. Galatians, by the way, is sometimes thought of a lighter version of Romans. So it's a good parallel to read as we study Romans. Anyways, in Galatians, Paul says in verse or chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. No longer are we slaves to sin. We have been freed from slavery to sin, sin which entices us to turn away from God for our own purposes freed from that bondage to sin so that we can return to glorifying God. The main goal and purpose in life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We can't do that if we are still bound to sin. As a result, Paul says, do not let sin exercise control in your life. Do not allow yourselves and your body to be used as instruments of wickedness, as Paul puts it. Sin has no longer any control in your life. It has no power in your life. Sometimes you feel powerless to change. Sometimes life seems impossible and overwhelming. Sometimes sin and wickedness seem so prevalent in the world that you just want to give up. Why bother fight? But Paul says that sin no longer has dominion over you. The problem is that we allow, we allow sin to have control. When we allow injustice to numb us and makes us apathetic to those around us. When we, when we trust other voices than the voice of the Good Shepherd. When we choose the easy road instead of taking up our cross to follow Jesus, sometimes we say that the devil made me do it. When we do that, we give the devil control over the things we do and say. There are so many ways in which we allow sin to both actively and passively influence and ultimately control the way we act, the words we say, and the way we think. It all boils down to making that conscious decision on who you will serve and follow. What are we listening to? What are we putting in our heads? 
How are we using our resources of time, talents, and treasures? Paul urges us, instead of offering ourselves as instruments of wickedness, to present ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. Remember how we were talking about doing dishes at the start of the sermon. There are some days when we are too busy, or maybe just plain lazy, and we don't do the dishes or run the dishwasher, and they get piled up. And so when it comes time to cook dinner, maybe we don't have the right pots. Or maybe we, when we sit down to eat, we don't have forks or plates to eat off of. At that point, we just go to McDonald's, right? But if we get too busy getting ourselves dirty, continuing to sin so that grace may increase, or because we're making that conscious decision to stray away from God, we've made ourselves unavailable for the work of God. We're offering ourselves elsewhere instead of offering ourselves as instruments of righteousness, instruments through whom God wants to extend his love and grace into the world and to do that work of fixing the things that have gone wrong, bringing justice and righteousness once again. Sure, God can still use us even if we've been wallowing in the mud. However, we would be much more effective in serving the Lord if God didn't have to keep on cleaning us up out of the mud. Alive in Christ does not mean that we could do whatever we want and simply trust that God will extend you forgiveness and grace. You're chosen by grace and made righteous for a purpose to show that love and grace that you have received from God to show that out into the world so that others might see the Lord through your life and through your worship. If we, you recall earlier in our study of Romans, we saw how the Jews thought that their status as the chosen people of God was because maybe they were better than others. They had the Torah, the law. They were circumcised as a sign as that of that status of God's chosen people. But Paul pointed out that their circumcision means nothing if they did not fulfill their purpose as the ones to light the way for the world to see God. They taught people the law, they enforced the law, but they themselves did not follow the law. Sometimes we can take being a Christian for granted. We say we we're Christians, we go to church. Some of us can even recall the day and the place where we dedicate, dedicated our lives to Christ. We remember our baptisms, and maybe we hold that as a sign that we belong to the church in Christ. But that baptism doesn't mean anything if we do not identify ourselves with Christ and count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And along with that, along with baptism as a way we identify as God's people, we also have this table. The table where we are reminded of what Christ has done for us. We are reminded that Christ is with us, and we look forward to the time when we could celebrate when Christ returns. All this is working together as our sacraments of baptism and our sacrament of, of communion, reminding us who we are and who we belong to, experiencing God in these, in these sacraments, that as we come to the table and as we partake in the bread and in the cup, we are reminded that we are God's people, that we are indeed dead to sin and made alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So let's remember that as we come to the table this, this morning, who we belong to, who we serve, and that we may indeed be made alive once again. Will you please join me in prayer? God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you have taken us and cleansed us and made us new. We pray, Lord, that you'd be able, that we'd be able to glorify you with the life that you've given us. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, you have given us that new life. Help us to live that way and help us to offer ourselves to you as instruments of righteousness that others might see your love and your grace through us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I was lost, I was in chains, the world had a hold of me. My heart was a stone, I was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence, I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, He loves me, He loves me, He's for me, and Jesus, how can it be? He loves me, He is for me. It was a fire deep in my soul. I'll never be the same I stepped out of the dark And into the light When he called my name I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms And Jesus scars the rugged cross where he died for me my only hope my everything and Jesus he loves me he loves me he is for me and Jesus how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. So we come to the table freely. And we receive from Christ the body that was broken, his blood that was shed. We receive that grace and we celebrate that today. Please join me in prayer. God, I thank you for this table. That we could come together as your body, your family, and celebrate 
the grace that you've given us, the love that is on display here. We thank you, Lord, for always loving us and offering us grace, even though we may falter and, and stumble. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to extend that grace to us. And so we thank you, Lord, for the bread and for the cup. I pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit, that as we receive these items, that we would experience your presence with us today and that you would turn our, our eyes to the resurrection that to come. So we thank you and we praise you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was arrested, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Following the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. Men, women, young and old will come from north, south, east, and west to celebrate at the table when Jesus returns. Everyone who has placed their faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior is welcome to um, eat from this table. I will, um, the servers will come through with our pre-packaged communions, and um, I'll give you the option of eating it here and receiving it here, or wait until you get outside if you feel that's more comfortable for you. Folks at home, we will uh, have the bread and cup, and we will celebrate together across, across space. Because even though we are gathered here, we remember you at home, and we, we, we are one body together. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. sent his son they call him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he bled and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know he holds the future Life is worth living just because he lives.
the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, help us to remember the price that you paid to redeem us all for love. And so we ask, Lord, that you would send us out to extend your love and your grace to the people around us. Help us to remember the new life that we have in you and share that life with others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's final war with pain And then as death gives way to victory I'll see the light of glory just because he reigns Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives all fear is gone because I know, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives, because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone. And life is worth the living just because he lives. You have been filled. You have been filled today with that's right. You have been filled with the presence of Christ. Take that fullness out into the world and share that love with others. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord smile upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.